The Babylonians are frequently understood as another empire in the long history of Mesopotamia that developed from the same peoples that formed earlier civilizations. They are considered broadly Mesopotamian in culture, dress, language, and religion. For this reason, it's important to understand who and what came before the official Babylonian Empire. As the civilization drew heavily from its predecessors, such as the Sumerians and Akkadians. The Origins of Babylonia The roots of the Babylonians can be traced back to roughly 3500 BCE, when a well developed Sumerian civilization started to emerge. The Sumerians are one of the oldest human civilizations on record. They were followed by a new group of individuals who spoke an early form of Akkadian around 3000 BCE. At some point, these two peoples engaged in such intense trade and social interaction that the majority of the region became bilingual, which allowed for intense and intimate culture sharing and borrowing. Even the languages became mixed together as people started to employ idioms, phrases, words, and even whole portions of grammar to get their ideas across. Eventually, Akkadian became more popular than the original Sumerian. Some scholars suggest this happened because the number of speakers with Akkadian as a first language slowly started to outnumber those who spoke the original Sumerian, while others believe it's because Akkadian became the language of business and religion. Either way, Mesopotamia saw the decline of significant cities and city-states like the famous Ur, Uruk, Eridu, and Lagash, thanks to the rise of the new Akkadian Empire. 2334 to 2154 BCE, which would replace the Sumerian Empire. However, this doesn't mean that the Sumerians disappeared. Those people were still around and actually became part of the Akkadian Empire. The only thing that changed was that Akkadian language and culture was starting to become more prominent and widespread, similar to how the ancient Roman Empire became Christian while the people that constituted Sumer and Mesopotamia remained. Even the major religious center of the original Sumerians remained the same. It was just now referred to as Akkadian. This would be the city of Nippur, where residents worshipped the god Enlil. This wouldn't change until Hammurabi emerged as the mighty leader of the Babylonians around the 18th century BCE. The Sumerians the Sumerians are the oldest known Mesopotamian civilization and considered to be the first. They settled the region between 5000 and 4500 BCE. Most historians believe they were a Western Asian people who moved farther west for greater access to resources and arable land that developed from the deposits of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. When in Mesopotamia, they divided into militaristic city-states which traded and fought with one another over territory. The cities were separated from one another by canals, rocky outcrops, and raised terrain that served as protection from attacks. Each city possessed a temple dedicated to a patron god or goddess. The government consisted of a series of powerful, land-owning nobles led either by a religious governor called an insi or a king called a lugal. The Sumerian written history can be dated as far back as the 27th century BCE, although most records come from much later, during the 23rd century BCE. This is because around that time, the Sumerians developed a new system of writing based on syllables. Contrary to popular belief, this ancient civilization demonstrated some unusual qualities, such as relative gender equality and cities which lacked walls and standing armies. During their early existence, the Sumerians experienced periods of great peace, and royalty and other prominent legislative figures would have both male and female advisors. For the temples, the gender of the high priest would alternate based on the god's form. So, a male god would have a female high priest, and a female god would have a male. This way of life changed during a span of time called the Early Dynastic Period which started around 2900 BCE and lasted until around 2500 BCE. Here, most of the unprotected cities disappeared, and society shifted to the governing system mentioned above, where nobles and a high priest or king controlled humans and resources. 
women slowly lost their place in society and were confined more and more to a domestic role as agriculture and warfare stripped them of their rights. A great resource for historians about this time period and one of the oldest pieces of human literature is the Epic of Gilgamesh. The Epic of Gilgamesh was written during the Akkadian Empire, but the man himself was one of the kings of Uruk and the most famous Mesopotamian hero. He ruled at some point between 2800 and 2500 BCE and would eventually be deified or made a god. His epic provides valuable information about Sumerian values and lifestyles, as well as the influence of religion and the gods on society and culture. There were a few reasons why the Sumerians slowly faded. One was the natural movement of more ethnic groups and different language-speaking tribes into the region. Another was increased soil salinity, or the presence of rising amounts of salt. This salt made it difficult to grow their stable crop, wheat. Even when farmers switched to barley, which would have been able to tolerate the salinity, it was too late. The Sumerians had to move from their homelands, which upset the balance of power and allowed the Akkadians to gain a regional advantage. The Akkadians Originally, the Akkadians were just another group living in Mesopotamia. After the Sumerians struggled and left their homes, the Akkadians managed to gain significant territorial and cultural footholds. Slowly, they built an empire which united the two peoples and brought Akkadian culture to prominence. The central city of the Akkadian Empire was Akkad, which historians still struggle to precisely locate. Its first powerful ruler was a man named Sargon. His personal background is unknown, as he himself made numerous claims, including having a changeling mother and an absent father. Once he aspired to be king, he changed his story so that his mother was actually a high priestess. This would have meant he was a noble and gave him legitimacy to rule. He began his life as a cupbearer to another king and worked his way to being a gardener who cleaned irrigation canals. Here, he formed his first coalition of soldiers from the other workers. Sargon displaced the original king and then immediately started to expand the Akkadian territory through conquest. He united all of Mesopotamia and then spread across the Euphrates River into an area known as the Levant. Here, he fought and dominated an ancient people known as the Hadians. He replaced any ruler who opposed him with Akkadian nobles and purportedly ruled for 56 years before dying of old age. He expanded trade considerably to include materials like silver and lapis and spread it north into Assyria, which would become the breadbasket of the Akkadians. After Sargon's death, the Akkadian Empire remained strong and powerful. The civilization and economy were carefully planned to fully maximize the efficiency of resources and the population. Staple foods like wheat, barley, and oil were kept in massive granaries and measured out to citizens. Taxes could be paid in money, food, or public service. In this way, the Akkadians kept their walls and canals strong through labor. The Akkadian language became ubiquitous throughout the Middle East and spread to nearby territories. Tablets containing it have been found as far as Egypt. By the 22nd century BCE, though, the Akkadian Empire struggled and toppled after lasting only 180 years. Historians propose a diverse array of reasons why this could be, as there isn't enough archaeological evidence to indicate a precise cause. The first idea is that there was a massive drought, which decimated the empire's agriculture making their way of life unsustainable. The second is that the empire simply extended itself too far and found itself unable to maintain control over city-states that fought for independence. The third is that nomadic hordes descended upon Mesopotamia and the Akkadian military was not strong enough to stop them. This last theory seems the least likely as the Akkadians held strict control over their immediate territory and there is the least amount of evidence for the nomad hypothesis. Descendants and successors of the Akkadians possessed their own ideas. According to one preserved tablet, the fall of the empire came about due to the sacrilegious actions of King Naram-Sin, who listened to two lying oracles 
and sacked a temple protected by the chief god Enlil. As punishment, eight of the gods gathered together and cast down judgment upon the empire. The text reads, For the first time since cities were built and founded, the great agricultural tracts produced no grain, the inundated tracts produced no fish, the irrigated orchards produced neither syrup nor wine, the gathered clouds did not rain, the mascarum did not grow. At that time, one shekel's worth of oil was only one half quart. One shekel's worth of grain was only one half quart. These sold at such prices in the market of all the cities. He who slept on the roof died on the roof. He who slept in the house had no burial. People were flailing at themselves from hunger. As the Akkadian star waned, the Babylonian star rose and would create one of the longest-lasting empires in history. There is little archaeological evidence to indicate when the first Babylonian dynasty developed, since the region possesses a high water table that led to the destruction of old clay materials. The evidence which survives to this day tends to be royal documentation, some literature, and lists of years and their corresponding names. For these reasons, not much is known about the culture and society of the first Babylonians although historians can clearly trace significant political and cultural events. Babylonia might not have fallen if Nabonidus had been a better ruler, but the odds were stacked against him. The population repeatedly expressed its dissatisfaction with his new social and cultural policies, but he didn't listen. He continued to elevate the status of the cult of sin while pushing back Marduk. When he did decide to focus on Marduk instead, he attempted to centralize worship at the temple in Babylon itself, which alienated the local priesthood that dotted the landscape of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Nabonidus' own military hated him as well, because he spent his time focusing on rebuilding the towns, unearthing old excavation records, and generally acting like a modern historian or archaeologist rather than as a warrior king. Nabonidus attempted to pacify the military by placing the defense of the empire in the hands of one of his favorite soldiers, Belshazzar. Although Belshazzar was an exceptional soldier, he was a terrible diplomat that managed to make the Babylonian elites hate him in record time. In particular, Belshazzar seemed to have concentrated military forces in Assyria rather than in southern Mesopotamia, which would leave Babylon open to attack and keep the military away from home for long periods of time without conquest. The fact that both men were also Assyrian, rather than Babylonian or Chaldean, further incensed the nobility. The Rise of Cyrus the Great The Neo-Babylonian Empire's greatest enemy would appear in the form of Cyrus the Great. Around 550 BCE, he was the Achaemenid Persian king of a city in Elam who led a revolt against his superior, Astyages. Astyages was the king of Medes who kept the Median Empire together to the east of Babylonia. The Median Empire was the term for the civilization created by the Medes, whom you might recognize as one of the Babylonian allies against Assyria. They dominated the other native Iranian peoples that lived in the region of modern-day Iran. Cyrus the Great convinced the army of Astyages to betray him, when Cyrus then established himself as a new, powerful leader in Ecbatana. His revolt ended the Median Empire and pushed the Persians to the top of the hierarchy of the numerous Iranian peoples living in the region. Within three years, Cyrus was the king of Persia proper crushing Assyrian revolts and making preparations to enter the Neo-Babylonian Empire for conquest. After spending 11 years consolidating his rule, Cyrus turned his attention to the Neo-Babylonian Empire. In 539 BCE, he invaded. Here is where the source material becomes murky once more. Primary sources such as the Babylonian Chronicles and an artifact called the Cirrus Cylinder, literally an ancient cylinder with writing engraved in the pottery, indicate that the city of Babylon fell to Persia without a fight, 
which could indicate the rulers realized they were overpowered and outnumbered. However, ancient Greek historians like the legendary Herodotus, who, while prone to exaggeration, is also a great source for ancient accounts of empires, indicates there was a siege. To further complicate matters, Abrahamic religious texts like the Torah and Bible state that Babylon fell after a single night's worth of battle, which resulted in the death of Prince Belshazzar. Which is true. When historians and archaeologists are faced with these many disparate accounts, especially when examining ancient history, the truth can often be found somewhere in the middle. Each of the three sources of information possess inherent flaws that need to be addressed, which is a common practice for historians, no matter what era they study. Ancient tablets tend to be heavily skewed in favor of the king who ordered their creation. Greek historians liked to exaggerate and make fantastic stories. And religious texts cannot be considered historical canon without evidence for a combination of the last two reasons. Keeping all of this in mind, what likely happened was a battle between the Persians and the Babylonians at a place called Opus, where the Babylonians lost. Without the strength of the Babylonian army, many of the other major cities surrendered without fighting the invaders, and Nabonidus, who had been camped with his army in the south, most likely fled to Babylon or Borsippa. Belshazzar died in battle, and the governor of Assyria, a general named Gabrias, sided with the Persians, pursued Nabonidus, and killed him without the need to besiege any of the cities. As a reward, Cyrus named Gabrias the new governor of Babylon, which became a province in the Achaemenid Persian Empire. The Assimilation of Babylonia The Persians divided the Neo-Babylonian Empire into several separate provinces and colonies, with the main two being Babylon and Assyria. Their gradual integration started around 539 BCE and would continue for centuries as Achaemenid Persia dominated the Mesopotamian landscape. Although Babylonian elites grumbled at the thought of a new power, many commoners and disaffected ethnic or cultural groups within the territory rejoiced. One of Cyrus's first actions upon consolidating his rule was to allow foreign exiles to return to their homes. In particular, he allowed the thousands of Jews who had been abducted and forcibly sent from Judah to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar II to return home. With them, they could bring their consecrated religious symbols, including images and vessels. It's telling that Cyrus is referred to in Abrahamic religious texts as the liberator of the Jewish people and is one of the only non-believing individuals to be called a messiah. In biblical accounts, he is the man who releases the Jews from their Babylonian captivity. Although they would live under Persian rule for centuries, the Jews were able to return home and never officially rebelled or took up arms against their rulers. Meanwhile, regular and native Babylonians still needed to be appeased. One of their greatest laws was that none could claim the right to rule over the territory until he had been consecrated into the office by the high priests. To appease this faction, Cyrus went through with the consecration took the title of the king of Babylon, and justified his rule by claiming to be the successor of the original Babylonian kings, and chosen by the patron deity Marduk to restore justice, order, and peace to southern Mesopotamia. Through this system, Cyrus managed to keep the peace, and appease the priesthood of Marduk until his death. Darius, Unrest, and Decline Peace remained in Babylonia until roughly 521 BCE. By this time, Cyrus the Great and his son, Cambyses II, were both deceased, and a new claimant to the throne emerged, Darius I. Darius I came to power in 522 BCE, after defeating a usurper who had killed Cambyses and attempted to gain control of the empire. Darius I, also called Darius the Great, saw no reason to appease the Babylonians and abandoned the chosen-by-Marduk narrative, 
in favor of pushing forward the Zoroastrian religion. Zoroastrianism is a monotheistic faith, meaning it has one God and identifies the duality of good and evil. Good will eventually triumph over and destroy evil, and there was a single supreme being of wisdom whom the Persians worshipped. While this wasn't the sole reason for a Babylonian revolt, it did destroy Persian claims to legitimacy. Once Darius I came into power, Babylonia tried to assert its independence under a new ruler called Nebuchadnezzar III. Nebuchadnezzar III ruled for less than a year before the Persians appeared and put down the rebellion in spectacular, bloody fashion. At the same time, Darius I held off similar revolts throughout the empire and reconquered Assyria. Six years later, in 514 BCE, the Babylonians once again declared independence, this time under the leadership of an Armenian man named Araka, who renamed himself Nebuchadnezzar IV. Darius I reclaimed the territory once again and partly destroyed Babylon's walls during the siege. These would not be rebuilt. Here, the story of Babylonia grows complacent. There were no more major revolts or revolutions for the next two centuries, and the city of Babylon slowly lost its importance and luster as peoples left and moved to the greater cultural capitals of the Persian Empire. Around 331 BCE, the Macedonians fought and kicked out the Persians, led by one of the greatest names in history, Alexander the Great. Alexander would die in Babylon in 323 BCE, most likely due to typhoid fever, although some believe he may have been poisoned. Once Alexander's former generals went to war, Babylonia and Assyria became a part of the Seleucid Empire, still controlled by the Macedonians. Babylonia lost its importance although urban life continued much the same as it had for centuries well until the 1st century BCE. The region would be absorbed again and again into new empires, states, and countries, but never again would it claim independence. The final fall of Babylon was complete. The religion of the Babylonians was that of Mesopotamia. The region possessed a cohesive cosmology, mythology, and structure of deities which were passed down over centuries. No matter what culture reigned supreme, whether it be the Sumerians, Akkadians, or the official Babylonians, the religion remained almost exactly the same. This religion was polytheistic, meaning there was more than one deity. Deities tended to have different domains, or areas of the earth and heavens over which they possessed control. There could be a god of the harvest, a god of storms, a goddess of fertility, or a goddess of love, among many others. Since religion stayed similar over millennia, this chapter provides an overview of major developments that occurred within the Mesopotamian religion including changes under the Neo-Babylonian Empire. A brief overview of what happened to the religion once the Hellenistic period arrived is additionally included. Afterward, there is a description of several of the major deities. The Mesopotamians The Mesopotamian religion, as it relates to the Babylonians, started with the Sumerians. As mentioned many chapters ago, the Sumerians were the precursors to the official Babylonians, which heavily influenced the culture, religion, politics, and economy of their successors. Many ethnic Sumerians would eventually become Babylonians, as the people stayed within Mesopotamia. The Sumerians possessed a theocratic society or one ruled by religious tenets, beliefs, and usually a class of priests or spiritual leaders. Sumerians were so dedicated to their religion and mythology that almost every aspect of life was seen to have been governed by one of the deities. Before a kingship developed in Sumer, there were the theocratic city-states with ruling priests. The most significant cultural buildings were temples. Originally, these structures were constructed from simple stone, 
and consisted of a single room for worship. As time went on, the buildings morphed into the legendary ziggurats. A ziggurat was a tall tower with a central sanctuary at the very top. It was not a triangle, but instead consisted of multiple terraced levels with broad stairs which could be climbed to reach the sanctuary. These ziggurats were not public. Sumerians believed them to be the dwelling places of the gods, so access was forbidden for the majority of the population. Some professionals speculate that part of the design, with its numerous levels, was so guards could be posted around the stairwells to keep the common folk from spying on religious rites and ceremonies. Each Sumerian city possessed a patron deity whose rites and rituals would be performed more often than others. There exists one major, well-preserved ziggurat still in existence, the Choga Zanbil in Iran. Almost all Sumerian myths were passed down through an elaborate oral tradition. An oral tradition is one where members of a culture learn about their people's history, stories, and religion through storytelling, or one person relating the tales to another. Written accounts didn't appear until the end of the early dynastic period, around 2600 BCE. These writings, in addition to the oral tradition, helped preserve Sumerian religion when their power waned. When the Akkadians started to displace the Sumerians, they adapted Sumerian religious beliefs into their own pantheon, where they were combined with pre-existing rhetoric and ideas. Unfortunately for historians, archaeologists, and other individuals interested in culture, many of the original Akkadian beliefs have been lost to time. What is known is that many of the major Sumerian deities absorbed the spots held by their Akkadian counterparts and developed new names. For example, the Sumerian god An became the Akkadian god Anu, with the same backstory, domain, and chief cities of worship. Finally, the Babylonians emerged. The Amorite Babylonians actually kept many of the traditional Sumerian and Akkadian deities, but made several major changes to the pantheon. In particular, they added the god Marduk, and ordained him as the head of the pantheon. The original goddess Inanna's role was also transferred to a new deity called Ishtar. Otherwise, the world remained the same, and the Babylonians preserved the Sumerian and Akkadian languages for the purpose of worship. The Mesopotamian Creation Myth there are several Mesopotamian creation myths, or stories, which focus on how the earth, heavens, and humans came to be. The main two are called the Eridu Genesis and Enuma Elis. The first is Sumerian, and the second is Babylonian, but there are many more that describe smaller acts of creation. Some of these others are the debate between sheep and grain, Song of the Ho, and debate between summer and winter. It's a common theme throughout the myths, where origin stories are told during conversations between personified objects, animals, seasons, and other inanimate creations. The earliest Sumerian creation myth comes from a clay tablet discovered by archaeologists during an excavation in Nippur. The document appears to be from 1600 BCE, indicating that it was recorded late in the time of the Sumerians. Historian Thorkild Jacobson named the tablet the Eridu Genesis myth and translated the cuneiform. Because of the advanced age of the relic, several pieces are missing, or the inscription has been worn away by the literal sands of time. However, contemporary audiences can still piece together the rudimentary story. It goes as follows. Nintur was paying attention. Let me bethink myself of humankind all forgotten as they are, and mindful of mine. Nintor's creatures let me bring them back, let me lead the people back from their trails. May they come and build cities and cult places, that I may cool myself in their shade. May they lay the bricks for the cult cities in pure spots, and may they found places for divination in pure spots. She gave directions for purification, and cries for clemency. The things that cool divine wrath, 
perfected the divine service and the august offices, said to the surrounding regions, Let me institute peace there. When An, Enlil, Inki, and Ninhushaga fashioned the dark-headed people, a name the Sumerians gave themselves, they had made the small animals that come up from out of the earth, come from the earth in abundance, and had let there be, as it befits it, gazelles, wild donkeys, and four-footed beasts in the desert. And let me have him advised. Let me have him oversee their labor. And let him teach the nation to follow along unerringly like cattle. When the royal scepter was coming down from heaven, the august crown and the royal throne being already down from heaven, he, the king, regularly performed to perfection the august divine services and offices, laid the bricks of those cities in pure spots that were named by name and allotted half-bushel baskets. The firstling of those cities, Iridu, she gave to the leader, Nudamud. The second, Bad Tibira, she gave to the prince and the sacred one. The third, Larak, she gave to Babislog. The fourth, Sipar, she gave to the gallant Utu. The fifth, Shurapak, she gave to Ansud. These cities, which had been named by names and had been allotted half-bushel baskets, dredged the canals, which were blocked with purplish wind-borne clay, and they carried water. Their cleaning of the smaller canals established abundant growth. A piece is missing here which describes how the noise created by the humans and their cities annoyed the chief god Enlil, so greatly that he decided to eliminate the Sumerians entirely. He persuaded the divine assembly of the various deities to vote for human destruction through a massive storm that would flood the world. Savvy students of history, mythology, or religion will note the parallel of Sumerian legend with numerous others around the world. The deluge myth, or the idea that the gods sent a great flood to wipe out humanity, appears in almost every major religion discovered across the globe, including Christianity, Hinduism, ancient Chinese mythology, ancient Norse mythology, ancient Greek mythology, Mayan mythology, the Lac Court Orielles, Ojibwa tribe, the aboriginals of Australia, and numerous other indigenous tribes throughout both American continents. The Mesopotamian flood myths, or those belonging to the Sumerians, future Babylonians, and others, are among the first. Anthropologists suspect that these first renderings and writings of religion spread beyond Mesopotamia and influenced numerous other cultures across the combined landmass of Africa, Asia, and Europe. But it doesn't explain how it crossed the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans unless the theory of gargantuan land bridges is true. Others, in particular the scholars of geology and the evolution of the planet, believe that something of climatological significance must have happened during humanity's earliest years, causing it to be recorded. No matter what the case may be, the Sumerian creation myth continues. That day, Nintur wept over her creatures and holy Inanna was full of grief over their people. But Enki took counsel with his own heart. And Enlil, Enki, and Ninhursaga had the gods of heaven and earth swear by the names of An and Enlil. At the time, Zisudra was king and lustration priest. He fashioned, being a seer, the god of giddiness, and stood in awe beside it, wording his wishes humbly. As he stood there regularly day after day, something that was not a dream was appearing. Conversation, a swearing of oaths by heaven and earth, a touching of throats, and the gods bringing their thwarts up to cure. And as Zeusidra stood there beside it, he went on hearing, Step up to the wall to my left and listen. Let me speak a word to you at the wall, and may you grasp what I say. May you heed my advice. By our hand a flood will sweep over the cities of the half-bushel baskets and the country. The decision that mankind is to be destroyed has been made. A verdict, a command of the assembly, cannot be revoked. An order of An and Indlil is not known ever to have been countermanded. Their kingship, their term, has been uprooted. They must bethink themselves of that. Now, what I have to say to you,
The part that is next missing appears to have been advice from the trickster deity Inky to build a boat and fill it with a male and female pair of each of the animals upon the earth. You might notice the parallels between this deluge myth and others, including the biblical story of Noah and the ark. Zesudra the king obeys and manages to save humanity and the animals from the flood. But Inky's plan is discovered when Enlil finds the survivors. He is about to massacre them when Inky convinces the Council of the Divine to spare humanity. The story ends with two stanzas of verse which explain how Zasudra ascended in the hierarchy of the heavens, and the Sumerians were spared. You here have sworn, by the life's breath of heaven, the life's breath of earth, that he verily is allied with yourself. You there, Anne and Enlil, have sworn by the life's breath of heaven, the life's breath of earth, that he is allied with all of you. He will disembark the small animals that come up from the earth. Zyasudra, being king, stepped up before Anne and Enlil, kissing the ground. And Anne and Enlil, after honoring him, were granting him life like a god's, were making lasting breath of life like a god's, descend into him. That day they made Zyasudra preserver, as king, of the name of the small animals and the seed of mankind, lived toward the east of the mountains in Mount Dilmun. Many of the significant Mesopotamian deities appear in this myth. Chief among the pantheon were Anne and Inlo, believed to have created the heavens and skies. The Mesopotamian gods were not human, and representations tended to make them anthropomorphic. Each one was a being of tremendous size, similar to a giant with unfathomable power. Stone carvings and depictions showed the deities wearing horned caps at all times, and special malum capable of inspiring terror and awe in any mortal who saw it. The Babylonian Creation Myth Historians place the development of the Babylonian creation myth, the Enuma Elis, to the time of Hammurabi, or around the 1700s BCE. There are several versions of the story, but the most well-preserved dates around the 7th century BCE and comes from the Library of Ashurbanipal. It's inscribed in seven tablets and varies significantly from the original Sumerian creation myth, but presents similar themes and ideas. An excerpt from the translated first tablet will be read following. Tablet 1 When the heavens above did not exist, and earth beneath had not come into being, there was Apsu, the first in order, their begetter, and Demiurge Tiamat, who gave birth to them all. They had mingled their waters together before meadowland had coalesced and reedbed was to be found. When not one of the gods had been formed or had come into being, when no destinies had been decreed, the gods were created within them. Lamu and Laamu were formed and came into being. While they grew and increased in stature, Ansor and Kisar, who excelled them, were created. They prolonged their days, they multiplied their years. Anu, their son, could rival his father's. Anu the son, Blindo Ansar. And Anu begot Nedimud, his own equal. Nedimud was the champion among his fathers. Profoundly discerning, wise, of robust strength. Very much stronger than his father's begetter, Ansar. He had no rival among the gods, his brothers. The divine brothers came together. Their clamor got loud throwing Tiamat into a turmoil. They jarred the nerves of Tiamat, and by their dancing they spread alarm in Andaruna. Apsu did not diminish their clamor, and Tiamat was silent when confronted with them. Their conduct was displeasing to her. Yet, though their plendor was not good, she wished to spare them. The first tablet covers the creation of literally everything, for before Apsu and Tiamat, there was nothing. From these two original deities came others, who disturbed Tiamat. To fight against them, Tiamat proposed the creation of monsters that would stop the direction in which the universe was moving. The following five tablets detail how her plan would not come to fruition, as several of the younger gods plot against her. 
Marduk is made the new overlord of all the deities, slays Tiamat by bashing her skull in with a mace, and uses her body to create the heavens and earth as humans know it. Marduk then goes about creating humans by sacrificing one of the other gods and using their blood to form the first Babylonians. At this point, the creation story ends with an entire tablet dedicated to praising Marduk and reading 50 of his numerous names, which indicates just how central to Babylonian religion this god was. Part of the translated text of Tablet 7 is included here, so you can get an idea of all of the things that were attributed to this single deity. Tablet 7 Asare, the giver of arable land, who established plowland, the creator of barley and flax who made plant life grow. Asaralim, who is revered in the council chambers, whose council excels. The gods heed it and grasp fear of him. Asara Limnuna, the noble, the light of the father his begetter, who directs the decrees of Anu, Enlil, and Ea, that is Ninsiku. He is the provisioner, who assigns their incomes, whose turban multiplies abundance for the land. Tutu is he, who accomplishes their renovation. Let him purify their sanctuaries that they may repose. Let him fashion an incantation that the gods may rest. Though they rise up in fury, let them withdraw. He is indeed exalted in the assembly of the gods, his fathers. No one among the gods can equal him. Tutu Zukina, the life of his host, who established the pure heavens for the gods, who took charge of their courses, who appointed their stations. May he not be forgotten among mortals, but let them remember his deeds. Tutu Ziku, they call him thirdly, the establisher of purification, the god of the pleasant breeze. Lord of success and obedience, who produces bounty and wealth, who establishes abundance, who turns everything scant that we have into profusion, whose pleasant breeze we sniffed in time of terrible trouble. Let men command that his praises be constantly uttered. Let them offer worship to him. Marduk thus took his place at the head of the Babylonian pantheon, rising above many of the other deities. Other gods of note were individuals like Ishtar and Nurgle, who controlled love, war, sexuality, and the underworld. In particular, Ishtar possessed one of the largest cults in Babylonia, and was considered the principal goddess for women, marriage, and childbirth, in addition to being a fierce, warlike deity. Nurgle, meanwhile, represented fire and the desert in addition to the underworld, and frequently appeared as a lion in his depictions. In contrast to the popular Greek myth of Hades and Persephone, Nurgle was not the original god of the underworld, but actually married Arishkagal, who shared her power with him. Nurgle could not stay the entire year and would leave for six months at a time, demonstrating the changing of the seasons. Babylon frequently appears in the Abrahamic religions as a symbol of decadence and sin. When referenced in documents like the Bible, it's important to realize that different passages are referring to the Babylonian Empire and to the city of Babylon itself, although both possessed the same connotations. The primary reason for the presence of Babylonia in these documents is the perpetual struggle that existed between the Babylonians and the Jewish people who lived to the west in a region known as the Levant. During the 2nd and 1st millennia BCE, the Jewish people attempted to form their own kingdoms, but were frequently overrun, conquered, and turned into vassals by their more powerful neighbors. At one point, these conquerors were the kings of the Neo-Babylonian Empire, who uprooted thousands of the Jewish people from their homes following a rebellion and forced them to live in Babylonia as captives. This action became known in religious texts as the Babylonian Captivity. Once the Neo-Babylonian Empire fell to the Persians and Cyrus the Great, the Jewish people were able to return home and wrote about their experiences in Babylonia in their religious documents. Now, 
It's important to realize once more that historians and archaeologists cannot accept documents like the Torah or Bible as fact, simply because the physical historical evidence does not exist. This does not mean that Judaism or Christianity is not true, but it does color the perception of events. For the purposes of this chapter, what was written in the documents of Abrahamic religions needs to be taken with a grain of salt, as the religious texts were repeatedly edited by the kings, high priests, and nobility to reiterate the Israelite belief that they were God's chosen people, that the nobles and kings possessed a divine right to rule, and that the Babylonians were clearly a sinful people, being punished for daring to act against the Jewish people. The Babylonian Captivity Keeping all of this in mind, Abrahamic religious documents tell a different story of the Babylonian captivity than that explained by historic sources as seen in previous chapters. According to the Bible, the situation went something like this. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of King Jehoiakim, son of Josiah of Judah, that was the first year of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, which the prophet Jeremiah spoke to all the people of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. For twenty-three years, from the thirteenth year of King Josiah, son of Ammon of Judah, to this day, the word of the Lord has come to me, and I have spoken persistently to you, but you have not listened. And though the Lord persistently sent you all his servants, the prophets, you have neither listened nor inclined your ears to hear when they said, Turn now, every one of you, from your evil way and wicked doings, and you will remain upon the land that the Lord has given to you, and your ancestors from of old and forever. Do not go after other gods to serve and worship them, and do not provoke me to anger with the work of your hands. Then I will do you no harm. Yet you did not listen to me, says the Lord and so you have provoked me to anger with the work of your hands and to your own harm. Therefore thus, says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my words, I am going to send for all the tribes of the north, says the Lord, even for King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, my servant, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants, and against all these nations around. I will utterly destroy them, and make them an object of horror and of hissing and an everlasting disgrace. And I will banish from them the sound of mirth, and the sound of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones, and the light of the lamp. This whole land shall become a ruin, and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. Then, after seventy years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon, and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, says the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. I will bring upon that land all the words that I have uttered against it, everything written in this book, which Jeremiah prophesied against all the nations. For many nations and great kings shall make slaves of them also, and I will repay them according to their deeds and the work of their hands. In this version of events, the Israelite God is punishing the people for their sins and failure to uphold the tenets of worship properly. The Neo-Babylonian Empire is sent to remove the Jewish people from their homeland, where they can suffer, until a time comes when they may return to their territory once more as God's chosen people. This text then places the Persians in the role of liberators, once more sent by God, specifically to aid the Jewish people while ignoring the geopolitical intricacies unfolding in the region. Babylon, meanwhile, is destroyed for being sinful and failing to worship the proper deity. The Whore of Babylon The other major instance of Babylon appearing in Abrahamic religious texts is the strange tale of the Whore of Babylon, who remains an iconic figure in Western civilization. She was a symbolic figure meant to represent evil and the temptations experienced by humans while on earth. She appears in the book of Revelations in the following passage. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, 
I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup, full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. The whore of Babylon is frequently associated with the Antichrist, as well as the Beast of Revelation. She is not a real person so much as a representation of idolatry and other major sins which would keep practitioners of Judaism and Christianity out of heaven. Historians and theologians alike speculate that she is associated with Babylon because of the aforementioned Babylonian captivity and previous comparisons that indicate Babylon equals sin and excess. So, why should a contemporary audience care about the Babylonians? It can be difficult for modern individuals to realize how much the actions of civilizations from thousands of years ago impact their lives in the present day. The Babylonians were responsible for several major scientific breakthroughs, including new mathematical methods for understanding the cosmos and creating calendars. They charted the stars discovered new building materials, and laid the foundations for other civilizations like the Greeks and Romans, who continue to be upheld by Western civilizations as the great forebears of contemporary political and social intellectualism. Like many of the other Mesopotamian civilizations, the Babylonians advanced agriculture, metallurgy, warfare, and other essential practices so humans didn't have to start over again every time a new people tried to develop their own culture. Frequent warfare and trade with other civilizations throughout the Near East, Asia Minor, and Northern Africa also meant culture, religion, and techniques could travel great distances. Babylon, or Babylonia, even had a great effect on the development of the Abrahamic religions, as there would be no captivity narrative without them. Even if someone doesn't care too much about these vital essentials, they can still appreciate the complexity of a culture that survived for multiple millennia and spawned beautiful artwork, intricate religion and worship, and unique laws and the basis for future legal systems around the world. After all, it was Hammurabi who came up with the infamous an eye for an eye viewpoint for examining the world in justice. Keeping all of this in mind, it would be difficult to imagine a world without the Babylonians. History is very much a tapestry. If someone pulls out one thread, the entire thing starts to unravel. This is the position of the Babylonians. A crucial thread that can't be removed without dismantling the course of human civilization as the contemporary world knows it. <laughs>